Okay, so uh, welcome, welcome back uh, to the I know online interactive lecture series. Uh, you have been uh, witnessing these lectures for now many weeks. Uh, I think this is twenty third week of these lectures, and uh, uh, we already crossed uh, fifty lectures on this. And uh, it's nice to see that so many varieties of uh, topics being uh, discussed by experts in various fields, both in India and abroad in this uh, series. And uh, also thank you very much for uh, all of you for joining and even uh, watching this offline. Uh, so that is really interesting. And uh, today we have another very interesting talk in this series, uh, which, are which is going to be given by Professor Rudra Jyoti Palit from Tata Institute, Mumbai. He's going to talk on in-beam spectroscopy of exotic nuclei with digital INGA and beyond. Uh, just a line, or, uh, a minute or two on his uh, introducing him. Uh, Dr. Jyoti Palit uh, is a professor at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai, uh, in the Department of Nuclear and Atomic Physics. Uh, he got his PhD in nuclear physics from TIFR itself in uh, way back in 2001. And uh, he did postdoctoral work at the Institute of Kent Physics, Frankfurt University, and GSI Darmstadt, Germany. He joined TFR as a faculty uh, back in 2004, and he's interested in the investigation of the structure of exotic nuclei and nuclear isomers. He is involved in the design and development of implementation of large gamma ray detectors like Indian National Gamma Ray, uh, gamma ray called INGA within India and uh, DESPAC, that is Gamma spectros Spectrometer called uh, DEGAS, that is the pronunciation at future fair facility, which is of course coming up again at the GSI uh, for nuclear structure studies. He's also working for the development of nuclear imaging techniques, uh, which is of course is in a very important aspect these days uh, of using detectors and instruments that people generally design and uh, develop for electric for nuclear and uh, high energy physics experiments. And they also have wide range of applications for societal benefits, including uh, medicine and imaging. So with those uh, few words today, uh, let us invite uh, Rudra Jyoti for his lecture. Uh, thank you, Dr. Satyanand. Yes, sir. Uh, and uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, so today I will be talking about uh, in-beam spectroscopy of exotic nuclei using digital INGA and beyond. Uh, so I'm glad that uh, uh, like some of you uh, who have initiated the program as a collaboration between different institutes are also present here. Uh, so before I start, I'd like to thank all the uh, the INGA collaboration and all the members of the collaboration. And as you can see, there are many people uh, who are uh, contributing in this uh, collaboration. And there are very young students and there are also a lot of experienced researchers. So uh, before I start, I'll give a brief uh, overview of uh, the different research facilities in nuclear physics. So this is uh, from the IUPAC report. You can see the all over the world, there are different facilities which are marked here by pink, you can see. And within India, the nuclear phys uh, physics facilities are mainly in the three uh, cities and uh, they are mainly accelerators and reactor based research. So, we have IUAC New Delhi, then we have at SINP a new accelerator is, uh, has been installed. Then in VCC there are cyclotron. VRC we have uh, reactors as well as uh, there is a small uh, handicraft accelerator. And in Mumbai uh, we have uh, the Pelletron and Linac. And uh, this is uh, where we do our experiments. And uh, the INGA facility actually moves between uh, Mumbai, Calcutta, and Delhi. 
So in Mumbai, uh, the accelerator has, is operational since 1988. And apart from nuclear majority of the research programs are nuclear physics, but apart from that, we have condensed matter physics, uh, atomic physics, radiochemical studies, and applications to medicine and environment. And it has trained large number of uh, PhD students in this uh, uh, 30 years. And this accelerator was augmented with uh, the a linear accelerator, which has been indigenously developed at uh, TIFR uh, in collaboration with the BRC. And this has really helped in doing uh, experiments with higher energy beams. So uh, this is the outline of my talk. I'll talk about the uh, various aspects of nuclear structure and gamma ray spectroscopy. I'll talk about the INGA experiments and uh, at Pelletron Linac facility in Mumbai. I'll discuss some of the selected results from the INGA experiment on now novel uh, rotations in weakly deformed and triaxial nuclei. And then I'll talk about the future, uh, the way we see the future of gamma spectroscopy and Indian contribution in fair facility in general. So nuclear physics today is a very broad subject. So uh, there are different aspects of nuclear physics. Uh, one is the study of nuclei at extremes, uh, how the pro different properties of nuclei uh, changes when we go from stable isotopes to uh, the limits of stability. What are the different properties uh, which uh, one can estimate by studying the nuclear nuclear interaction is also an open question, and there are many developments. Uh, the development in nuclear structure research is directly related with the nucleosynthesis and abundance of uh, different isotopes in the universe. Another major application of uh, nuclear physics is the development of detectors and accelerators which can be used for the various applications and one of the major application is of course uh, nuclear imaging and uh, which has direct relation with the uh, the type of detectors which we uh, which are used in nuclear structure experiments so there are main three themes. One is the precision measurement of uh, different uh, nuclear properties, which we do it in nuclear structure. And these help us uh, and uh, to do stringent test of different nuclear structure models. And this has impact in different length scale. So this is the main theme of nuclear structure today. And it's a very broad subject. So uh, this is an article which shows about what is nuclear spectroscopy in uh, almost like uh, uh, 37 years ago, this publication was there. It says that nuclear spectroscopy deal with study of nuclei, how nuclei absorb and emit energy. This has progressed dramatically in uh, last few decades and has effects in the fields as diverse as astrophysics and medical diagnostics. So this article appeared in Physics Today in 1983, and there they talked about two uh, type of uh, spectrometer. On the left-hand side, you have this Q3D spectrometer, and uh, this is used for studying the nuclear structure by looking at the uh, charged particles emitted in the nuclear reaction. And uh, this is a pretty complex uh, setup. And uh, this gives very interesting uh, information about the nuclear structure. On the right hand side, there is this uh, Compton suppressed germanium detector. And uh, this is something which gives very precise information about the nuclear structure. So over the years, this field has you know, like developed quite a bit. And I will tell you the story which uh, uh, goes on in India using the accelerator with uh, high resolution detectors. So what is nuclear structure? 
So one of the main thing about nuclear structure is based on the precision frontiers uh, in the nuclear physics. And this is uh, a quote from uh, Professor Judge Draculis who gave uh, the summary talk on the uh, nuclear structure 2012 at Argonne. He says that spectroscopy study is hard, characterization is even harder. But if one does a very good job on uh, the spectroscopy, we are going to get new informations and interesting aspects about the nuclear structure we'll be able to find out. So what we do in nuclear structure is that we do coincidence measurement for spectroscopy we do, which gives idea about the different quantum labels in the nucleus. We do for the angular distribution and uh, correlation study and uh, polarization measurements of the gamma rays to assign the quantum numbers like angular momentum and parity. We need to measure the lifetime of the excited states that gives idea about the overlap of the wave functions and uh, electromagnetic moment measurements are required to look at the diagonal matrix elements in case of uh, the nucleus. So all these uh, measurements are crucial to give nuclear structure information. And uh, based on that, we, uh, we are able to extract new information about the structure and dynamics of the nucleus as we change the angular momentum or isospin in the nucleus. So how do you produce uh, nuclear excited states? We can use different type of nuclear reaction for production of the excited states of the nuclei. And uh, we can use uh, fusion reactions, we can use fission reactions, transfer reactions, fragmentation, and uh, spallation reactions. But here I am trying to show a very simple uh, reaction, which is the fusion evaporation reaction. We have the beam from the accelerator, which is high enough so that it can uh, do nuclear reactions with the target uh, atoms. And then you have a compound nucleus which is formed. And then after that, light charge particles are emitted and neutrons are emitted. And from there, uh, the nucleus starts uh, getting uh, going to the lower excited states by emitting large number of gamma rays. And by measuring these gamma rays, we are interested to find out what is happening in the nucleus. And that is what is shown on the right hand side of the figure. Typical, this is uh, the x-axis is the spin or angular momentum of the nucleus. And uh, y-axis is the excitation energy. So as you can see, that after the nucleus is uh, formed and decaying uh, after particle emissions, it comes to this entry distribution. And from there, the gamma rays are emitted, which can have different multipolarities. And by measuring those gamma rays near uh, at the lower uh, excitation energy, we can get very clean information about the nuclear structure. So, uh, this is the, these are the microscopic level. You can see that at a given spin, the lowest state, uh, this is called the Iras state. And as you go higher in excitation energy for a given spin, the density of states, they increase and things becomes unresolved at higher excitation energy. But near the Iras state, the density of states are less and one can resolve these states and from there one tries to extract the information about the structure of the nucleus. So what are the challenges in the in-beam gamma spectroscopy? In a typical reaction, large number of gamma rays are emitted in a short time interval. What do you mean by short time? Say few couple of nanoseconds. Not always the same isotope is produced because it's uh, in a nuclear uh, fusion uh, reaction. You can have different type of particles are emitted, different number of particles are emitted, and you have different isotopes which are produced. When you go for the fission experiments, you have even larger number of isotopes which are produced. 
So it's a challenge to identify which gamma is coming from which nucleus. So for a same isotope, the gamma cascades are also very different. For the, from timing, it is very difficult to say which gamma is emitted first and then which one is second, third and so, and which one is the last. So we need to do, uh, need the complete energy of the gamma rays. And uh, like, if you are interested in the complete energy, you need a detector with high photopic efficiency. And typically, photopic efficiency, even the best of the detectors are of the, currently are of the order of 10%. And in future, one thinks that maybe one will be able to do around 20%. So this says that this, ex these experiments are actually extremely uh, difficult because you need to detect 20 to 30 gamma rays within few nanoseconds. And uh, they are emitted uh, in a, a very small uh, time interval. And the only way you can do is uh, this type of measurement is repeating the collisions millions of times and collect the data because the photopic efficiency is small. So over the years, uh, what uh, has been developed is summarized here. So like the detector is like a lens and with the lens, uh, we can see what is happening inside the nucleus. With a few detectors, uh, the collective rotation was uh, established back in 1960. And then heavy ion induced reactions with smaller arrays, which I showed in the previous slide, around 1980, uh, the interplay between the collective and single uh, particle degrees of freedom has been investigated and a lot of things have been learned. Now it's a high uh, heavy ion induced reactions and radioactive uh, uh, beam experiments have been carried out with large array. Different type of electromagnetic spectrometers are coupled with the uh, large gamma array. Also different type of other ancillary detectors have been used. And with that, one can try to see that what is happening inside the nucleus and how what is shown here that each nucleon inside the nucleus they behave like a gyroscope and when the gyroscopes they couple in a different way uh, you find out very exotic uh, phenomena and one of the main aspect of nuclear structure with gamma spectroscopy is try to understand what is happening inside the nucleus and how the different coupling of the nucleons uh, the gyro uh, gyroscopic motions are affecting the shape of the nucleus uh, when we increase the angular momentum or isospin. So uh, the gamma rays uh, are very crucial uh, to give information about this uh, nuclear structure. And all this happened in 1937 where Bohr and collaborators, they proposed that we could learn about the structure of nuclei by detecting their gamma ray emissions in analogy to his atomic model. So here, over the years, the development of the detector has been shown. Uh, we start like uh, with the sodium iodide detectors, then germanium uh, lithium uh, detectors, then you have small germanium based detectors. And then now people are talking of uh, large gamma tracking uh, arrays. And uh, in between, there are developments based on Compton suppressed germanium detector, which reduced the Compton background. And this has given very interesting uh, phenomena in the nucleus. So what are the main properties of this type of detector? You need to have a good energy resolution. You should have high photopic efficiency. You need to have good peak to total ratio. The position resolution uh, need to be better. Uh, these detectors should give directional information. It should be able to measure the polarization of the photons. And if one uses the ancillary detector, then one will be able to reduce the background. Tracking will uh, provide new opportunities and meet challenges of the new uh, gamma ray tracking that will reduce the position resolution 
uh, improve the position resolution and will be able to help in doing a spectroscopic study for very rare isotopes. So here, the resolving power of the array is uh, uh, the uh, resolving power depend on the peak to total efficiency and the spacing of uh, the uh, different gamma rays and delta E is your this uh, uh, the resolution of the detector. So uh, if you have all these properties, then uh, one can improve the detection efficiency of the array. So uh, why one should study this? So this is the uh, lecture uh, in 1974, where Bohr and Mottelson, they said that the angular momentum world of the nucleus is a fascinating subject. And uh, this is again the spin versus excitation energy and so new phases as a function of angular momentum and excitation energy was uh, like, seemed to be very, uh, an exciting field. And this picture is uh, like highly conjectural. However, with indigenous experimental approaches that are being developed, uh, they say that we may uh, look forward with excitement to the detailed spectroscopic studies that will eliminate the behavior of uh, spinning nucleus. And what has happened? This was the uh, something like they conjectured that time. And what has been studied over the last uh, 40 years is summarized here. So you can see that it's amazing that in nuclear physics over this last uh, 40 years, you have so many aspects Effects of the nucleus has been studied and many things are discoveries. You have this super deformed bands, you have hyper deformation band which has been predicted has not been confirmed. And uh, there are aspects about the magnetic rotations, there are aspects about the backbending, there are uh, need for complete spectroscopic study to look for rotational continuum and chaos. So it's very, uh, one should say that this is a field where you, because of the high resolving power of the detectors and improvement of the detectors, you could uh, look at very different phenomena and many of these phenomena were not expected or calculated before, but this thing emerged uh, from the many body system and experimentally one people observed something like a magnetic rotation, then they found out, okay, there is a model which can explain. So this says that this field is, um, here, this field is driven by the experimental efforts and uh, one can uh, expect to see many new aspects still today, uh, which are not known. So this is a nice uh, summary of uh, different detectors, uh, which are used in uh, nuclear structure. So this is an article uh, which uh, explains about the nuclear gamma spectroscopics and the gamma spheres. So as you can see here that there are different detectors which are uh, available worldwide and many new things are also developed. And the first two detectors mentioned here, they are the gamma tracking detectors, and these are the future of gamma spectroscopy. First, studying nuclei at uh, uh, at the extreme. So, I'll talk about the INGA, which is listed in this uh, uh, article. So, INGA, as you know, is a collaborative effort of uh, different uh, labs, universities, and IITs across India. And this has started back in 2001, where different institutes, they agreed to pool their resources to make a, a collaboration and to do experiments with higher uh, efficiency. So uh, in 2010, uh, the array, uh, after uh, successful completion of uh, campaign in Delhi, Calcutta, and uh, 2001 in TIFR, it came back to TIFR in, uh, again in second time in 2010. 
and the array was coupled with a digital based data acquisition system and along with the germanium detectors and the visio detectors this detector like uh, we also plan to include different type of ancillary detectors like cesium iodide detector silicon detectors and lanthanum bromide detectors i'll give you some of the uh, results from these experiments and some of the efforts uh, which have been put for on the technical side for the development of the ancillary detectors and uh, data acquisition system and softwares so the dsp uh, digital signal processing based data acquisition has increased the data throughput by 10 times compared to the previous uh, campaign where the analog systems have been used so this is uh, the schematic of the experimental uh, setup with uh, the data acquisition so this is based on the 100 megahertz digitizers where are 12 bit adcs the system is highly versatile with complex triggering systems it can handle it can run at high count rate uh, uh, and it has uh, the capability to uh, record the data with minimum dead time it has high gain stability it is uh, it can run both in the trigger mode as, as well as in triggerless mode and uh, because of this we can study uh, the long lived isomers in this experimental setup so here you can see that uh, the x axis is the count rate and y axis is the uh, resolution of the germanium detector and you can see that we can count uh, at a rate of two of the order of 40 kilohertz with a minimum reduction in the energy resolution and uh, if you have done uh, the analog electronics you know that beyond uh, 10k it becomes very difficult to get any reasonable uh, resolution for the germanium detectors so this is the uh, time difference between the events uh, because each time a detector is fired we get the energy information as well as in the time information in resolution of 10 nanosecond and uh, you can see that uh, this initial portion says the prompt coincidence and then you have the uh, random uh, or the delayed coincidence are shown here so what has been done in last 3 uh, years we have uh, like we have uh, been working on the development of uh, two detectors one is the lanthanum bromide detectors have been coupled with the clover array and uh, there is also effort for development of a plunger system so that we can measure lifetime in the range of uh, a few picosecond to of the order of nanosecond and beyond that of course using germanium we will be able to measure the lifetime so we have really uh, enlarged the scope of uh, timing measurements by adding the lanthanum bromide detector and hopefully we will be able to complete the project for the plunger uh, so that we will be able to study even the lower light types so what are the uh, challenges for this type of uh, uh, detectors see one of the thing is that the different detectors which are used for the study of the radiations which are emitted in the nuclear reaction so i i have given a very brief uh, uh, a summary of the different type of detectors one is the germanium detector which are slow because the rise time can be of the order of 100 to 500 nanosecond while in case of lanthanum bromide detectors the rise time is of the order of 10 nanosecond while in case of cesium iodide detectors they are again slow so they can be of the order of uh, uh, 800 nanosecond to few microseconds and the count rate which you are talking about in a typical experiment is like 10k for germanium crystals uh, 30 to 50k for lanthanum bromide detectors and cesium iodide detectors we are expecting 4 to 8k so the requirement for each type of detectors are very different and the readout scheme has to be different for uh, handling this type of detector so this poses a challenge how do uh, we take care of uh, coupling of the different detectors and merge the data to get the info coincidence information so this has been achieved by developing a, 
uh, a scheme where we can couple, see, you, we know that in a DSP based data acquisition system, the sampling rate is uh, sensitive to the type of detectors which we are planning to use. Like for lanthanum bromide detector, we need a higher sampling, which is like 250 megahertz. Uh, while in case of uh, germanium, we and cesium hydrate, 100 megahertz digitizer will work. The problem happens that how one can couple these two different type of uh, digitizers. So for that, we had to develop uh, a, a software which can uh, control the different uh, type of sampling in two crates and synchronization has been done with a trigger board uh, which uh, sends the uh, common clock from one crate to master crate to the uh, secondary crate and these are the trigger modules which are there on the back side of the uh, crate and uh, this is you can see that the 96 channel of the clovers are shown here and uh, the 14 lanthanum bromide detectors have been digitized in the 250 megahertz. So both this thing has been, uh, the data has been taken simultaneously and with the common clock, they have been synchronized. And this has been done very recently. And uh, this uh, slide says that here you can see that uh, the red one is the energy spectrum of a cobalt source. Uh, and, you see, and the blue one is the energy of the uh, germanium detector and you can clearly see that the germanium has a better energy resolution uh, compared to the lanthanum bromide detector and uh, this is energy re resolution is of the order of 0.2 uh, percent while in case of lanthanum bromide detector it's of the order of 2 uh, percent so uh, almost a factor of 10 better the germanium detector that's why you use it for the spectroscopy. But on the other hand, uh, the timing, you find out that uh, the lanthanum bromide is uh, much better compared to the germanium detector. So we, uh, by coupling the lanthanum bromide with the uh, germanium detector, we will get the best uh, of the two world. And that's what we have achieved in a recent experiment. We have measured the lifetime of a 11 minus state in 137 lanthanum. And uh, we have got something like this, a preliminary analysis where we got around 270 picosecond lifetime, which is impossible to get using germanium detector. And this is the state 11 mi uh, half minus. Previously, uh, this state was, uh, this is our result from the present measurement. And previously a limit, uh, upper limit of 410 picosecond uh, was uh, given in a older measure. So why do you want to study this 11 half minus state? Because we are interested to look for the octopole coupling of uh, with a particle in 137 lanthanum. So this is an interesting uh, subject where people have studied uh, the particle uh, core coupling in case of 49 uh, calcium. But similar studies have not been done for nuclei around n equal to 82. So that's why we have studied in case of 137 lanthanum. And we find out that uh, uh, this is the neutron number and uh, this is the B3 uh, value. So this B3 value gives the idea about the enhanced octopole uh, surface mode in the nucleus. And uh, you can see that uh, as you go from lighter to heavier lanthanum isotope, there is a steady increase of the B3 value. This was the previous data with the upper limit of on the lifetime, but this is our data which says that uh, the, it's the B3 value is large. And interestingly, you find out that this B3 value is uh, uh, comparable to the even core, which is 136 barium, which is closely related, uh, like uh, the value is very similar. So that says that by coupling a particle with the octopole surface mode of the even even nucleus 136 barium, there is no damping of the octopole strength. So another development which we have done is uh, a charged particle array, which uh, we have developed 
and we are also doing a collaboration with the IUC for the development of the uh, preamplifier. And in a recent experiment, we have uh, studied uh, the charge particles using the cesium ionide uh, uh, detectors and signal processing of these uh, detectors. You can see that uh, the detector can uh, distinguish between the proton, alpha, and gamma rays. And by putting a condition on the proton, we can get the uh, proton spectrum in case of uh, yttrium 18, uh, 90. And similarly, by alpha coincidence, you find out that uh, the alpha spectrum comes out very nicely here. And this is the uh, below figure here is the total projection. So the idea is that whenever you have a total projection and the channels are very weak, you cannot see these transitions like here. 1564 is almost in the uh, below the uh, near the background and it clearly comes out with the alpha uh, getting and this type of uh, uh, procedure is really used to study the weak gamma rays which are emitted in a, a nuclear reaction and to suppress the background and this detector this goes inside the chamber here uh, Another experiment recently, which was done, is to look for the nuclear uh, level density. And uh, this is, uh, you can see that here the 68 zinc emitted uh, from the excited state of uh, the zinc. In coincidence with the gamma rays, we have measured the charge particle and uh, the energy of the charge particle spectrum was fitted with the statistical model to get the uh, level density parameter. And uh, this experiment uh, was done by the SINP group. And from the uh, level density parameter, uh, they have extracted the uh, capture cross sections uh, using the Thales calculation. And uh, you can see that this nicely uh, reproducing the uh, neutron capture cross section in, and to produce the 69 zinc. And uh, this is the, uh, the black ones are the uh, present uh, data. So for nuclear structure, what are the questions which we try to understand or ask? One is the ex collectivity or the exotic shapes, uh, novel excitation modes, evolution of cell structure, uh, pairing interaction, octopol collectivity, which I gave some example. And then we also study the isomers and depletion and fission. So today I will be mainly talking about uh, these two aspects of the uh, nuclear excitation mode, which is the obling mode at low spin and the magnetic rotation and beyond uh, using the array, whatever the results you have got, I'll try to uh, present that. So what do you mean by uh, the triaxial shape of the nucleus? The nucleus, see one aspect of the nucleus is that the nucleus are mostly quadrupole deformed and they are like the ellipsoid. So when you talk of the triaxial shape, these are the three axes uh, which are there, the major, minor, and the intermediate axis. If the length of these axes are all different, then we say that the nucleus is triaxial. And what type of difference we are talking about? We are talking about in a moderately deformed nucleus, we are talking about 5% difference between the major axis, intermediate axis, and the uh, minor axis. So we're talking about a very small difference in the length scale. And uh, what are the impact of that? First thing is that it's a very fascinating, it shows a very fascinating response towards the rotation. When you have rotation, such a small uh, difference in the length scale in the ellipsoid axis, it can give a very interesting uh, rotational response, which we are interested. Apart from that, uh, the fragility has an impact on the nuclear mass and binding energy. It affects the beta decay. It affects the nuclear capture rates. Photoabjection cross-section also changes and it also changes the fission period. So some of the references here gives the different aspects which have been listed. 
So here you can see that uh, in a paper uh, where they looked for this uh, ground state energy and they found out that out of this 7000 nuclei which are possible, only 70 nuclei have, uh, if you have triaxial deformation included in the calculation, you find out that about uh, only 70 nuclei are sensitive to such deformation. And they are of course related to the cell structure in the nucleus. And uh, that's why the nuclear triaxiality at the ground state is a very interesting aspect. Uh, and uh, robot, uh, robust triaxial shapes uh, have been, uh, people try to look for the impact of that by studying the uh, rotational spectra, uh, mainly by the gamma bands and uh, uh, mainly by the gamma bands previously, but now people are trying to find out other aspect of the like chirality and obling, and we'll try to see what are the impacts uh, which we can try to measure in the experiment. So uh, this again uh, shows that the capture rates, uh, if you don't take the triaxiality parameter, if you just use the axial parameter, the beta decay rates will be different. Uh, this is the barrier. If you see that uh, the fission barrier also changes if you have uh, a triaxiality parameter. And uh, that's why understanding the triaxiality is, of course, a very interesting aspect which goes beyond just the rotational uh, response of the nucleus. So uh, there are two uh, phenomena. One is uh, the chirality and the obling mode, which are uh, uniquely related with the triaxiality of the nucleus and the associated symmetry. Uh, what do you mean by uh, the chirality here? So when you have a triaxial nucleus, you, the core angular momentum will be always along the intermediate axis. And if you have a ordered nucleus, then the proton and the neutron, one of them can be formed along the uh, short axis, the other one along the long axis. So you have uh, you have the rotation intermediate axis, another and the uh, short axis, the other along the long axis. So they can form a left-handed and right-handed system. And because of this, you can find out that uh, there are uh, degenerate states which will be formed. And because of which there are a lot of experimental investigation which has been uh, carried out to establish uh, the chiral motion. Another thing which has been predicted by uh, Bohr and Mottelson, the obling mode in case of even even nucleus. And uh, this is mentioned that the robust triaxial shapes have been sought after for decades. The study of rotational motion in nuclei with asymmetric shapes is potentially a field of broad scope that has been mentioned. Uh, so in order to pin down the triaxial deformation, it is essential to find the phenomena which are uniquely uh, related with the axially asymmetric shape. So uh, many experiments have been carried out. As I mentioned before, because of uh, this left-handed and right-handed uh, uh, symmetry which are possible, if it is slightly broken, you can have uh, degenerate uh, states and there are certain uh, selection rules. And based on that, uh, one will be able to establish the chiral rotation. So number of experiments have been carried out with the Inga. But there is another aspect, which is the obling mode, uh, which uh, says that uh, the nucleus is uh, triaxial. So few experiments have been carried out using Inga. I will present some of the results from here. So uh, first evidence of uh, long uh, the obling mode in nuclei has been established in uh, uh, 2001, but that was at a high spin. And uh, the direct evidence is uh, uh, like has been established in 163 lutetium. And uh, this is uh, analogous to the motion of an asymmetric top, which was predicted more than 25 years ago, but was, has not been identified. But this is at the very uh, high speed. But if you remember, um, 
the uh, predictions, whatever the original prediction was for low spin and also for the even even nucleus. So it is of course interesting to look for such uh, cases. And uh, one uh, groundbreaking paper came in 2004 by Frounder van Donau, where they say that at low spin in odd nucleus, such a bullying mode will be possible. And uh, here, uh, what one finds out that if you have such a, uh, the Hamiltonian of such a mode will be uh, a rotational part plus a vibrational part, which is a phonon part where the phonon energy will depend upon the moment of inertia along the intermediate short and long axis. And experimentally, we'll get a sequence of rotational band and interband transitions, whatever will be, you will have different rotational bands will be there with different parabola and they will be connected by delta I equal to one E2 transitions. So uh, this is the wobbling frequency, but depending upon whether the angular momentum of the odd particle is coupled with the, uh, is perpendicular to the uh, core angular momentum, or it is parallel to the angular uh, core angular momentum. Based on that, two modes, transverse and long, longitudinal mode has been predicted. Experimentally, uh, one of the indication is that the uh, frequency will increase with uh, uh, angular momentum uh, for the longitudinal mode. And uh, in case of uh, transverse mode, it will decrease at a higher spin, uh, but there may be a, a slight increase at the lower spin. So experimentally, it is interesting to establish such a mode. And uh, over last five years, this field has really uh, picked up in a very uh, interesting way. Many papers have come and the first paper and uh, the fourth paper here, these are the result based on the obling mode, which have been carried out in Mumbai and uh, using Inga and uh, very recently another paper, uh, which looked for a certain aspect of the transverse obling, which has come from Inga by an experiment, which was carried out at VCC. Uh, so this is the experiment in transverse obling in 135 uh, PR. Here, this is the uh, ground state uh, band where you negative parity band, which is the rotational band. And this is another band which is there, which again a delta I equal to two rotational band is there. This decays to the, the uh, main band here by these transitions, which are delta I equal to one transitions and delta I equal to one transitions have been established by looking into the angular distribution of this uh, uh, transition. And this experiment, uh, the angular distribution was done at uh, gamma sphere. Uh, in um, Mumbai using the Inga, the gamma rays polarization has been measured. Polarization means whether the scatterings are this the uh, parallel crystals within the germanium clover detector, we have four crystals. So uh, then if the scattering is uh, parallel to the uh, reaction plane, this is more uh, parallel than you may have uh, the par uh, electric or the magnetic transitions which are there by measuring the polarization. We have been established that uh, this is the, uh, these transitions are mainly delta I equal to one E2 transitions. This is the polarization asymmetry with the gamma ray energy. So the obling frequency from the energies, we find out that this uh, goes down and then increases. So this is uh, the black one is the experiment. And from there one establishes that a transverse obling has been uh, established in case of 135 PR. We looked for the same uh, neutron number, but uh, uh, Z we reduced by two. We look at the 133 lanthanum at low spin. And uh, we looked at uh, this reaction has been used. 
and 21 uh, clover detector has been used. Again, we find out a rotational band here, which was known before, but we could do a precise measurement of multipolarity of this linking transitions, which are crucial to establish the obling nature of the uh, band. So uh, these are the uh, angular distribution of uh, the different transitions, which are the linking transitions here, 758, 874, and 982. And uh, we looked into the angular distribution of these transitions. We also did the uh, polarization of the uh, transitions. And from there, we established that uh, these transitions are again E2, delta equal to one. And uh, this is uh, what we see here. And similar measurements was done, of course, for 131 cesium. And from there, we find out that for all these three isotopes have same neutron number, but the proton number changes by two. And we find out in case of 135 PR and 131 cesium, this is uh, transverse obling while the frequency increases in case of 133 lanthanum. So this was a very surprising result and it took a lot of time to establish what is the reason behind this. Uh, so if you look here, the in case of, uh, if you look for the frequency versus the uh, spin, you find out that the behavior in case of, 130, uh, of this plot in 135 PR and 133 lanthanum are very different. And uh, one of the reason which came out is that uh, the alignment of the pair of H11 of protons uh, along the short axis, which increases the effective moment of inertia along the short axis, and that causes the increase of the obling frequency with spin. So this was done, and but this question was bothering that how to establish more because the other two isotopes are transverse and why this is uh, uh, the frequency is increasing with spin. So for that, we uh, carried out a magnetic moment measurements of the uh, band head. And this is used in a superconducting magnet where you have a two Tesla a magnetic field. And the same reaction was used the rotational spectra gave a magnetic uh, moment, uh, which is uh, used to uh, find out that what is happening in this uh, nucleus. So we find out that uh, the, uh, this is the 11 half state, which is the isomer. And we find out that uh, the G factor of uh, this state, experimentally, whatever we have measured uh, is, uh, very close to the uh, theoretical uh, calculation, which gives a value of 1.16 with a very large scale cell model calculation. And within error, our numbers uh, match pretty well. And uh, apart from the experimental uh, magnetic moment, we also extract the quadrupole moment and uh, the amplitude of the quadrupole moment, and we get 1.71. So uh, this measurement clearly identified that the G factor uh, of this state says that the 11 up state isomer here is a coupling of a H11 up proton with 132 barium, which is at zero plus. So following our measurement, uh, a, a theory group uh, uh, calculated the uh, magnetic moments and they found out that uh, the magnetic moments for the erast band as well as uh, the obling bands are necessary to establish uh, the obling uh, mode. And uh, here you can see that our like measured uh, G factor matches very nicely with the model. But depending upon whether the angular momentum is parallel to the total spin or perpendicular to the total spin, depending upon that, the G factor will vary quite a bit for the erast as well as the opening band. And similarly, the quadrupole moment also will be very different. So experimentally, uh, like uh, it's a challenging thing to measure the magnetic moment for even the shorter lift states and additional investigations are required, but such measurements are necessary to establish what is happening, the dynamics of the angular momentum coupling of the particle and core. And here it's a angle between the uh, single particle and uh, the uh, total angular momentum. 
and you can see that here depending upon the whether the particle is in the erased band or in the uh, oblique band the angular momentum total angular momentum with respect to the uh, uh, long axis as well as the uh, projection of the angular momentum in the uh, short axis and intermediate axis plane with respect to the short axis these things one can calculate and of course they are very different if you have a of the for the rust band and the oblique band and however to establish this thing the g factor measurements are required and uh, that's what is shown here you can see that uh, the intermediate uh, the along the long axis the angular momentum is uh, the particle angular momentum is zero the core angular momentum is also zero but here it clearly establishes that the uh, the uh, parallel coupling between the core and the uh, single particle excited uh, angular momentum so this is the summary of uh, the result of the triaxial nuclei and uh, further investigations are required for transition from transverse to longitudinal mode in the other mass regions there are interesting results which are coming in one mass 180 region and in future we will be able to do pulex experiments to study the uh, with isomer beams to understand the triaxial shapes and the oblique band so satya can i uh, know how much time is left uh, another 5 5 minutes 5 okay. to 10 minutes is it okay okay, yeah. okay. so i uh, will uh, quickly go through another aspect uh, of the uh, nucleus which is a magnetic rotation so magnetic rotation is uh, coming where the angular instead of a charge distribution the current distribution has certain asymmetry and because of which you have magnetic rotation so if you have a deformed charge uh, distribution then you have e2 transitions and uh, these are uh, this establish the super deformed uh, structures or rotational bands but in case of uh, magnetic uh, uh, rotation here the uh, m1 transitions are uh, emitted and they also form a rotational structure so uh, here what happens is that the proton particle and uh, uh, neutron particle and proton hole uh, they form some type of shears and the orientation of this angular momentum this changes and because of which you have a rotational band and many experiments have been performed and because of uh, uh, time let me try to show you what is happening here you have here in case of a, a conventional shears you have the energy where it is these are the gamma ray energies which are increasing and this however the parity of the states are uh, same and the transitions are delta I equal to 1 so these are m1 transitions and this is what you can experimentally prove in case of magnetic uh, rotation Uh, so one of the clear signature of the magnetic rotation is that the lifetime of the states you can measure and see that with increasing lifetime the bm1 value falls rapidly and this is a unique signature of magnetic rotation uh what is interesting and open question for this is if you go to the excited states <clears throat> for the non erased states such transitions can give uh, such excitation modes can give a enhancement in the low energy uh, spectrum uh, and because of which uh, we can get uh, like different productions of uh, isotopes in the neutron capture reaction and and this is uh, for the very neutron rich nuclei the neutron capture reaction changes if we don't have this upbend here okay if the upbend is m1 or e1 this will have impact and because of which we need to study some of the properties of nuclei which are non erased here you can see this is the spin versus excitation energy so one has to study the properties of uh, the non erased states here uh, and try to measure the polarization of these uh, transitions and their decay rate and uh, we are planning to 
uh, use inga and uh, charge particle detectors to study some of these non era states and uh, some initial experiments have been carried out to look for uh, this type of non era states using pp prime reaction we have uh, dr dinesh negi who is uh, who has joined recently and we are initiating a program to study these non era states and to see that uh, whether we can measure the polarization of the states. So uh, in future, we want to upgrade the array with a um, larger number of detectors. Of course, we are also uh, working on the development of another detector for FAIR and if possible, we'll be able to couple INGA with uh, the DGAS detectors. And there we'll be able to enhance the efficiency by a factor of two and then there are many interesting physics problems which we'll be able to study and uh, try to uh, understand about the uh, nuclear uh, modes. So another aspect is uh, the fair facility, which is coming up. In, I'll take two more minutes and then. Okay. Yeah. So fair facility is coming in uh, Darmstadt, Germany, which is an international uh, facility. And India Fair collaboration has been uh, found based on the interest of the nuclear physics community and government has signed an MOU with the uh, Federal Republic of uh, Germany and this facility can give beams from uh, proton to uranium and uh, many radioactive uh, beams with very higher intensities can be produced and antiprotons also will be uh, produced and one can do experiments with this. So when we have such radioactive isotopes we can uh, try to, so these are the uh, black ones are the stable isotopes and what during the uh, nuclear uh, uh, R process, you have these isotopes which are very far away and properties of these isotopes are necessary to understand the modeling in nuclear astrophysics. However, we'll be able to go towards some of these very neutron rich isotopes and uh, even if the yields are very less, you can see that we will be able to study say 10 to the power minus 3 per second. So we need to have uh, tools to study such low yield uh, uh, isotopes. And why do you want to study this? Because when you go away from line of stability in the neutron rich site, you can expect neutron halos, neutron skins, and some of the excitations like pygmy resonances, which can be uh, studied and this has direct consequence on the equation of state of nuclear matter and properties of neutron star. So uh, FAIR will provide unique uh, access to many nuclei relevant for explosive nucleosynthesis and uh, some of the questions which we will be able to answer related to the origin of the elements which is really uh, interesting uh, beyond nuclear physics. So combine accurate nuclear physics precision, uh, uh, nuclear physics experiments with the precision astronomy to constrain the astrophysical scenario. That is the main theme of uh, nuclear structure studies at FAIR. So uh, we, in uh, around uh, late isotopes, we will be able to study very neutron rich nuclei. As we go from phase zero, phase one, phase two, we will be able to go produce many neutron rich nuclei and we'll be able to cover the third waiting point uh, region of the nuclear uh, in the, for the R process. And uh, we aim to measure masses, beta decay lifetimes, neutron branching, strength distribution and level structure, which will be uh, really the main uh, aim for the new star low energy experiments where we are involved. So we have uh, part we have been participating in the development of uh, a degas uh, detector, which is germanium detector, which is uh, decay uh, uh, for the decay spectroscopic studies. And many collaborators from different universities and institutes are involved. So uh, the different components for the detectors and electronics have been developed at the IFR and uh, in uh, GSI. And uh, this is one detector which will really uh, be uh, helpful to study the very uh, rare decay isotopes. Uh, of course, in future, we plan to develop uh, detectors which are required for even lower yield isotopes. So this is something which has been 
the demand for the future to look for detectors which have gamma ray imaging capabilities. And uh, this is uh, the different R&Ds which we are working on. Uh, this is one is the lanthanum bromide detector, which is coupled with a position sensitive photomultiplier tubes. And you can see that with the collimated source, uh, the source, uh, the position resolution is uh, very nicely uh, 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 reproduced. And we are trying to study the pulse shaping using the germanium detector. And this is the uh, data which we got depending upon. So this is, we are scanning the detector with a sodium source here. And depending upon the interaction in the detector, the shape of the pulses are different. And based on that, from the rise time of the pulses, we'll be able to find out the interaction depth in the detector. So this brings me to the summary of uh, on the today's talk. So I gave you a flavor of uh, the type of uh, effort which goes in uh, developing a large array to look for uh, nuclear excitation modes, uh, the development of different ancillary detectors. I talked some result about the oblique mode in mass 130 region at low spin. And uh, in future, we will be uh, able to study very neutron rich nuclei using our process using the gas or Agatha type of detectors and explore the structure of nuclei at the drip line and cell structure is a local feature and is still to be discovered experimentally. Uh, challenges for development of new generation of gamma detectors uh, to study the rare isotopes. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'd like to acknowledge all the students and the engineers and the collaborators and uh, the Peletron staff, uh, central workshop, uh, the LTF facility, and of course, uh, the DST uh, funding agencies. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Palit, uh, for this very um, exhaustive and also, I mean, bringing up uh, many important developments all the way starting from your Inga uh, initiative and uh, the campaign uh, which uh, went through uh, fantastic success stories in terms of the physics that is attained. More importantly, it also brought together the nuclear science community of uh, four major uh, centers or labs coming together and collaborating. Uh, that is a very interesting concept as a whole, and uh, I think it has uh, gave fantastic physics. And also switching over to the fair <coughs> opportunities and the initial R&D that you have shown in which you are already developing I understand India is one of the major countries, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of contributing to this project and also many physics experiments and your developments on germanium detectors, looking at the bright uh, uh, physics possibilities is quite interesting. All the way, the, the detectors have been at the center of all these studies and uh, uh, and also the, the spin-offs and applications are something I think which are going to be equally interesting for the society. Um, with uh, those comments, I would like uh, if anybody has questions to the speakers, uh, those on the uh, on the Zoom, please raise your hand or you can ask your question directly. Uh, meanwhile, I would like to take some questions from the uh, YouTube. Um, uh, okay, there are a few questions. One of them is, uh, this is from Abhinav Chaudhary. Uh, what are the advantages of light ion beams for gamma ray spectroscope? Yeah, so see the light ion beams, like uh, if you use uh, alpha beams, uh, alpha beams, the one of the advantage of the light ion beams in fusion reaction is that it's highly selective. So, and the uh, like, Unlike the heavy ion beams, uh, the light ion beams, you have only one or two channels uh, residue type of residues are produced. And you can do fantastic experiments, uh, detailed spectroscopy of those states, those isotopes. The other thing is that using light ions, you can uh, populate more favorably the uh, non-ERA states compared to the heavy ion fusion reaction. So this is one aspect. And again, the other thing is uh, some of the direct reactions um, study using light ions are of also uh, importance. So. Uh, how do we, how
how do weak binding and proton to neutron asymmetries affect nuclear properties? Um, see the proton neutron, see if you have uh, the as proton, more proton neutron asymmetry, one thing which changes is the nuclear uh, binding energy changes. When the nuclear binding energy changes, the uh, neutrons uh, or the particles near the Fermi surface, they become uh, like uh, weakly bound and they can really uh, tunnel through the uh, barrier and they can, uh, they have a very large extension and that causes neutron halo or neutron skin. And apart from that, if you have very weak binding, then some of the properties like pairing and clustering also changes. So these are the uh, aspects which one expects to study when you have very uh, asymmetric nucleus. So that's what is shown in this slide. Uh, yeah. So. Here, depending upon uh, when you go for very neutron asymmetry, you can uh, form these neutron halos, yes. where the last uh, neutron is really well, very, uh, have a large extension compared to uh, the bound uh, neutrons. And then you can also form the neutron skins and then different motions like pygmy resonances can be observed. So. Okay. Um, uh, participant, can one store energy in a nuclear isometric state and can one extract it in a controlled way when required? Yeah, so uh, this is one uh, thing which the concept is there. Of course, you can store this, but you have to uh, produce them in an uh, reaction and uh, if one can make macroscopic quantity of type of trigger of using a bremster long or low using low energy accelerators, maybe it will be possible. And we have carried out one ex such experiment for 108 silver, where the isomer is around uh, 110 kV and 400 years. So the idea is. Uh, the short answer is yes, it is possible. We are, people are exploring, different groups are exploring. And for such studies, the spectroscopic measurements are quite useful information to see that whether such a thing is feasible or not. Okay. Uh, we have just one more question. Uh, what is the total photo peak efficiency of Inga? Uh, for Inga with uh, 24 clovers, the at uh, uh, photopic efficiency is about 4.8 percent at 1 MeV. Okay, uh, let me check. Are there any more questions on the on the Zoom? Uh, there's one from Deepak. Yeah, please, Deepak, go ahead. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to just know that when Inga goes to Kolkata or Delhi center, do they also use digital uh, electronics? Uh, in uh, in uh, Calcutta, they are right now using uh, digital electronics. In the last campaign, they. And is it uh, is it any different from your philosophy or uh, similar? Uh, the broad philosophy is uh, similar. Uh, the only thing is that we are using uh, BGOs uh, like uh, the BGO Vito detectors. We are using uh, and uh, the BGO uh, signal we are using as a Vito in our DSP, but they are digitized. So that is the only difference. Otherwise, uh, it is same. No, what I mean is that uh, they, what is their speed? So you have 100 megahertz. What so is that? We, we have here 100 megahertz uh, for germanium and 250 megahertz for lanthanum bromide. Yeah. They have 250 megahertz for the full thing. Both? Yeah. Achha, no, achha. so they are not using lanthanum bromide. They are using for uh, the germanium and BG. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just let me check once again if there are any more questions on this side. No. 
Uh, so, I guess there are no more questions, uh, Palit. So, I, uh, on behalf of all the participants, once again, I would like to thank you for taking your time and uh, giving this very nice uh, informative as well as exciting talk on the particularly developments in the uh, in the detector, but also the physics that going along one by your real workhorse. Uh, that is Inga and also the upgrades that are expecting, but also giving a peek of, um, uh, of, uh, of uh, the pair and the various, pro various experiments that are coming up there. And I think exciting uh, results can be expected soon from there. What is the, so right now, uh, apart from TIFR on the detector, or I would say for experiment side, uh, who are all, which are other groups which are involved? Uh, for the Inga? Yeah, no, no, for the fair, uh, the fair side news. Uh, uh, for the fair side, uh, Delhi University is involved, uh, Punjab University is involved, and then uh, the uh, for the fair, VCC is involved for the development of the neutron detectors. Uh -huh. Okay, so it's uh, VCC, TFR, Delhi, Punjab. Yeah, and then there are many other universities who are involved, but slowly once uh, things uh, uh, become more uh, like more experiments of st will start maybe big plan. groups will join and, we'll join. and, uh, and IUSC is also involved for gamma ray uh, for the charge particle tracking detectors so okay. they have developed some gas detectors and is Bose Institute mainly involved for uh, accelerator uh, uh, Bose Institute is the nodal uh, uh, Institute from the DST sites for the funding, okay. and they are mainly involved in the CBM experiment. Of course, for the accelerator development of different components, mm -hmm. they interface with the industry. And mm -hmm. it's okay. Okay. so thanks once again, uh, Palit, for uh, your nice talk, and uh, also thank you everybody for joining. Uh, uh, we have a talk by uh, Professor uh, Govinda Mazumdar. Uh, that is uh, on 5th October, that is the next week. Uh, the title of his talk is, Should We Take All Published Data at Face Value? So that is the title of his talk, uh, very provoking title. And I hope many of you will come back and join uh, that lecture as well. Until that time, uh, take care and stay safe. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you, Satya. Thanks.